I'm Kristen Brzezowski, the executive editor of TV Drama, and I'm speaking with writer, creator, actor, and producer Miranda Kwok, who among her many credits is creator and executive producer of The Cleaning Lady. Hi, Miranda. Hi, Kristen. So nice to be here. And we're delighted to be speaking with you. To go back to the beginning, how did the idea come about to bring The Cleaning Lady to U.S. audiences? Well, the project was actually brought to me through Warner Brothers. Um, I was working with Warner Brothers on a show called The Hundred. And um, actually, I worked for four seasons on that show. And after the third season, I, um, I was out of my contract and uh, they weren't sure if they were getting a pickup. And so I went out looking for another job. I got a job offer and uh, told the people at The Hundred and they said, no, 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 we want you back. And um, so they went to Warner Brothers, um, who then reached out to us to say, you know, if Miranda will come back to the hundred, if it gets picked up, we'd love to offer her what's called a blind script deal. So it's a development deal. Um, so the hundred came back and I, of course, said, you know, I, of course, said yes, the hundred came back and I was working full time on that while developing this project. And how it usually works with a, a blind script deal, it means that you have decided to um, basically develop a project together, but you haven't quite identified what that is. And so I pitched Warner Brothers a few ideas, then they pitched me a few ideas. And one of them was La Chica Que Limpia, which is the Argentinian format. Um, Shay Mitchell was the one who found the original project and they optioned it for her. And then they were basically going out to the different writers that they have in the Warner Brothers family to see who would be interested in pitching a take. So I, um, so I pitched a take and, um, you know, seeing Shay Mitchell on board, um, who's half Filipina, I thought, well, you know, why not have this character be from the Philippines and have a Southeast Asian character, which is something we've never seen on American television, um, not as a leading character anyway. Um, so, uh, you know, so that, that's essentially how the project came to, to me. And did you know of the original telenovela beforehand or were you a fan of it? I didn't know about it beforehand. No, they sent me all um, all twelve episodes. It's like a you know, it's a half hour program, and um, and what excited me about adapting this project? Well, there's there's two things. One, I've always wanted to do like a, a like a, a Breaking Bad. Breaking Bad is like my favorite show, and so I wanted to do a female Breaking Bad. And so in adapting this project, there's like a few elements that I wanted to sort of layer in, um, which is you know the so the original was she's like a you know, a cleaning lady who ends up in the wrong place at the wrong time and um, and then is forced to work for the mob. And um, she also has an immunocompromised child. Um, so what excited me was not only was she going to, you know, just be a cleaning lady, but eventually, you know, become a sort of mob boss in her own right and sort of, um, you know, take take charge. Um, so, you know, so I definitely saw like you know, the Argentinian format was a one season show. Um, and so in bringing it to an American audience is trying to figure out how to make this a show that could last for many, many seasons. Um, the other elements that excited me to um, to incorporate into the American version um, was that, again, not to have her just be a cleaning lady, but somebody who is a doctor in her country um, that isn't able to work in the U.S. as a doctor because her credentials don't translate. And, you know, the, you find that that is such a familiar story with so many people from different countries. And so, you know, I definitely wanted to, to bring voice to that. Um, and then the other layer that I thought was really exciting to, to, to put in there was to have her be an undocumented immigrant. And, you know, that is such, a, you know, a hot topic right now. But, you know, sometimes people can be afraid to address it and address what that means, what that looks like, and really give voice to that. And so, um, so I was excited to, to basically have the lead character and, and, and her sister, um, basically be undocumented immigrants and, and show their struggles and um, not only their struggles, but also how they, how they, you know, face up to the challenges and, you know, how she, even though she is a cleaning lady and she is silenced and she's pushed into the shadows and told not to, not to speak, not to, you know, raise her voice, not to, you know, raise a stink about anything um, and how she basically defies all that and, you know, finds her own strength and defies all the obstacles laid out before her. 
did you have a platform cable broadcast or streaming in mind when you started working on the project? And why is Fox now the perfect home for a show like this? I definitely felt like I would be pitching to cable and streaming initially. Um, for one that, you know, this that's just the kind of, that's just usually the platform where stories like this land. Um, not only are the sort of the darker criminal elements of it, um, the serialized element of it, and also mostly um, that the, the the leads were going to be primarily diverse characters. And, you know, at the forefront of the show are now, is now this Filipino Cambodian family, um, but we have diverse characters across the board with, you know, um, Latinx characters, um, Armenian characters, and we really just wanted to to show, um, you know, all these different characters from different backgrounds um, and different cultures, and 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 really delve into their, those characters. And so normally, those you know, those are shows that um, aren't as embraced by mainstream media or they're not usually put on mainstream media because um you know it's a little it's a little out of the box and um you know but as i was developing the project um with warner brothers um they said to me you know a few weeks away from from pitching it they said you know we've been talking to the networks and right now there seems to be a much greater appetite and audience for diverse voices and marginalized voices and we would love um, to pitch this to networks first and i was like okay well i don't want to change the story right this is you know okay i won't be able to you know have you know any you know we'd have to adjust language and nudity and violence and all that and scale that down but what was most important was the story and so i said i don't want to change that um but sure let's pitch it and see and we pitched to five networks, Fox was the first and they scooped it up immediately. And now, um, yes, as you said, like I feel like it was so fortunate um, to have such a broad platform to actually tell this story. And, you know, when you, when, you, know, when you set out to, to uh, you know, create a show or tell a story. Um, usually it starts with a lot of late nights in front of your computer. And, you know, uh, you know for me, I'm, I'm just trying to hit deadlines and try to tell the best story I can. And I'm not usually thinking about like, who's my audience and, you know, you know is, is, anybody, is anybody gonna watch this or what are they looking to see? I just wanted to tell the story that I felt was important to me to tell a story that mattered to tell a story that you know reflected um you know characters and voices that we hadn't seen and really platform those and now um being on a broadcast platform allows the show to be seen by 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 a much larger broader audience and you know it's honestly it's blown me away how well it's been received and you know the statistics were that um, you know, we were getting three to three and a half million viewers live um, the night of airing, you know, with all the commercials and everything, which is really difficult to do in this climate when you do have a lot of streaming platforms where you can binge watch and not have people wait. Um, in the first week, I heard we were getting uh, approximately or on average 5.3 million viewers. And now, um, you know, 12 million people have watched the pilot. And that has been incredible because people who who don't normally have access to cable and, and streaming, who, who can't pay for those extra services, are able to watch the show, are able to see themselves reflected in the show. Um, and also our messages um, are getting out there. And, and, and honestly, I think that's that's the most exciting and important thing that's that's come out of this. Um, you know, it's not just that, oh my God, 12 million people have watched the show. It's 12 million people have watched this show with these messages and these characters and, and they're, they're, they're really invested. Um, and part of that is because, you know, we're telling such a universal story. You know, it's a parent who is fighting for everything to save her child. You know, it's people who are struggling, um, you know, in, immigrating to another country to, to survive and, and what that means and the struggles they face. And um, I think because it's so universal, um, that's why it's widely received. Oh, and I did hear um, a statistic from Nielsen who said that 90% of our audience is actually non-Asian. So it really does, um, it really does speak to, to all of that. And I, I honestly, I'm so grateful for all that too. 
let's talk about how the show does bring some of these marginalized voices to the forefront. And is this a passion point for you in storytelling? Absolutely. Uh, I, you know, I think, um, I, I think one of the most important things as a storyteller is, again, to tell stories that matter, um, tell stories that can reach hearts and minds, um, things that can affect people so that it can bring a greater understanding about humanity. And ultimately, that's what this show is about. It's about humanity. And I, I think, you know, when you show these characters that you don't normally see, what you're, you're doing is you're opening people's perspectives um, and, and ideas. And, um, you know, I, I think, first of all, that starts with just show it having very multi-dimensional characters. I mean, we're all very complex beings. Um, we all have many different layers. We all have, you know, different histories and backgrounds and family and culture that affects who we are and how we see the world. Um, but at the same time, the more we can just show that and, and put that specificity on screen, the more we can understand each other and then understand that at the core, we are all more the same than we are different. You know, we all have our hopes and dreams. We are all trying to take care of our families. We all have fears and tragedies and crises that we face. And how do we, how do we get through that? How do we find our strength? And, 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 you know, go through that journey. So I think those are all, um, those are all themes that have always been important to me as a storyteller. And the way this show does it, it doesn't feel forced or like it's being put out in this really overt way. So how did you and the team, cast and producers included, go about bringing forth such authentic and nuanced portrayals of a multi-ethnic group of characters? Well, again, I think that starts with the uh, having, um, you know, embracing each character fully for who they are and everything they bring and all the layers. Um, you know, if you don't have multidimensional characters, then, you know, the show can't be a success because, you know, people aren't, they don't feel real. So I think that, that that's, you know, to start with, there's that. And then also we really made a point to have authenticity, um, you know, not only in front of the camera, but behind the camera as well. And we really made it a priority to find writers and talent that, you know, represented the voices that were on screen are also in the writer's room. Um, and, you know, e even on the crew as well, like we, we try to diversify our, our cast and crew as much as possible to, so that we can speak to those voices and those experiences. Um, you know, it's really hard to understand what it's like to be in someone else's skin unless you've had those experiences. Um, but at the same time, we also open up to, you know, all the writers in our room can speak to, you know, their perspectives on, on everything and everyone, um, not just like, oh, you're, you're the Mexican writer, you can only speak to that, which, you know, what is sometimes what you hear in other writers rooms and, you know, no, like we all have the different perspectives on the, on the world, and they're all they're all valid, right? They're, they, we all see things a certain way. So it's a matter of talking through them so that we understand all these perspectives so that we can, I guess, show the nuances of what that means on screen instead of giving what a single idea of a character is or a single experience is. Like we try to flesh out um, the totality of what some of these experiences. Having worked in this industry for quite some time, when did you start to notice a shift in the representation of voices and perspectives on screen? How much work is there still left to go? And what can the industry as a whole do to step up a bit more? Yes, I, I have been working in the industry since I was a child, actually. <laughs> Um, I, I got my first um, television debut when I was 13 years old and, um, you know, it was a struggle. There was a time when I thought I was going to quit the industry because the rules were so limited because, um, you know, that the rules that I was getting, you know, were more stereotypical or, or just, um, you know, just limited, uh, you know, because, as an Asian woman, people will always see me as an Asian woman. It's hard for them to get past that. And, you know, as a writer, you're able to sort of, you know, tell different perspectives and, and that has been exciting. Um, but I definitely feel like, you know, I, because there haven't been a lot of stories about, um, you know, Asian families and Asian characters as, as fully fleshed out as they can be, um, you know, I think that's one of the things that inspired me to to pitch stories with um, Asian characters 
um, to try to to try to get that representation on screen, and, and that has been something that has been important to me. Um, and so this isn't the first show that I've pitched with these stories. Um, and so, you know, I, I think, um, you know, I, I want to screen, you know, I, I won a major screenplay competition with a story that centered around a lot of, um, of Asian and, and particularly female Asian characters. Um, and, um, and I also pitched a story a few years back um, that was uh, called Snakehead, and it was about an immigrant smuggler. And, um, you know, I had Michelle Yeoh attached to the project. I, I had, you know, um, you know, a big, a big director attached to the project as well. And that went to a script stage. Um, but I think, you know, a lot of those, you know, it, it was still, even though people were interested, it was still taking a risk. And so I, I, I definitely can say that there was a, a shift when Crazy Rich Asians came along and, you know, blew the box office out of the water, right? And, and it really just, again, showed that there's an audience and appetite out there for um, not only diverse stories, but specifically Asian stories. Because um, I think the diversity has been getting better, um, you know, through, through the years, but it has been better for other communities. Um, but less so for the Asian community. And, and so I feel like that's something that I feel like Crazy Rich Asians has, has really, um, the success of that has really opened the doors. And, um, and so by the time I started pitching this project, I felt like, yeah, people were wanting to hear, oh, like what, what is this, you know, what is it that you're bringing to us? Um, and that was so culturally specific. Um, and again, it's, you know, it's both culturally specific because of the characters, but at the same time, it's universal stories that speak to everyone. What are some of the considerations that you evaluate when deciding what projects to take on? Um, well, again, I, I think it, you know, it has to excite me um, on, on many different levels. Um, I think the story itself has to have some meaning, um, but also, you know, it has to it has to just be a great story, right? And again, that speaks to the humanity of people. It, it speaks to our hopes and our dreams and our fears. Um, you know, I, I, you know, the other thing that makes a show um, a lot of fun is that there's that criminal element to it, right? It is, it is that breaking bad element. It's about, you know, breaking the law for all the right reasons. Um, and again, showing people in circumstances that you don't normally expect um, and, and show how they maneuver through that in a surprising, exciting way. So I, I think those are, you know, you're, you know, I think everyone's always looking for like, what's the new fresh idea um, or the different take on an idea. So I think those are the kinds of elements that, that I find exciting um, that I feel like I, I can dig my teeth into. Tell me about your experience working in the U.S. studio system and how that differs from the international market. Well, I've definitely worked um, a little bit in both. I mean, most of my experience has been, I guess, in, more in the, the American studio system. Um, and I guess, uh, you know, obviously I'm not, I'm not, you know, selling shows like, you know, on in, in the international market. So um, I can't really speak to that. But I do know, like, the, the way you sell a show in the U.S. market can be a little different. So there's no, um, there's no, you know, right or wrong way to do it on the international market. Um, but so for the US market, usually um, it's much more uh, creator driven. And so, um, you know, when you pitch a show, what you usually do is you first pitch, you know, why you, why you're the right voice for the show. And so before you even begin your actual pitch, you tell them um, a bit about yourself and why you want to tell this particular story, you know, what it means to you. Um, and then, you know, again, that speaks to voice. They want to know, you know, what perspective they're getting when, when they're getting a show. Um, so you first pitch that, you know, then you launch into like, you know, the teaser, the thing that draws you in that what's going to grab an audience right away. Um, and then you talk about like the world, you know, why, why this world, why the show, why, why now? Um, and before launching into like the characters and um, the pilot, and then ultimately like, you know, where season one could go and um, a little, little teaser of what season two and beyond could be. Um, and once um, you pitch that, you know, usually you get a producer attached to begin with. They help you hone your pitch. And then um, you take that out to the networks 
Um, so I worked with, you know, for example, I worked with Warner Brothers for five months, you know, honing this pitch, honing this idea um, where we really dug into the details of it. Um, and then right before we went to pitch to networks, we were fortunate to attach a, a showrunner. Um, and, you know, you don't always um, have the, the ability to do that um, because the showrunners that have the experience also are in high demand. And, um, you know, so the first show that I pitched, I didn't have a showrunner attached. You know, I sold the show to FX and, and basically developed that with the studio myself. So this time, um, you know, we were able to get a showrunner attached right before we went out to pitch. And so once we sold the show to Fox, then, um, then, then it's time to write the draft. Um, so basically I wrote the pilot and it ended up being the first drama pilot that was picked up um, that year, which was right before COVID. Um, and so once, once the studio decide, or sorry, once the network decides what shows they want to actually shoot, um, and, and that year there was only four. So then you shoot the pilot and then, um, again, you review it, you get test audiences, you see what the response is. And then that's when a show is finally greenlit to series. And then at that point, um, that's when you would assemble a writing room and, um, get the rest of the scripts, you know, uh, written. Um, but you know, about you, you want to get, you know, maybe four or five scripts in the bank before you start filming. So that's the process. <laughs> that's the process of the, you know, the, the studio network system. Um, internationally, I've had different projects come to me where, um, you know, you know, I had an Italian production company come to me who wanted to do like a Chinese um, a Chinese Italian co-production or an international co-production. And so um, for so they basically hired me to pitch them like what is a general arc of a season. And um, once they like that, I, I wrote the pilot and then they they decided to just write um, or have have us write 12 episodes. So I wrote 10 episodes of a of a 12 episode season. And then now they're taking those scripts to try to sell them to different ter territories internationally. So um, so it's a little bit different. And sometimes, you know, and then other times, um, you know, you you assemble a team and you have a pilot, um, and then you try to, you know, have a mini room. Um, to, to write scripts as well. So there's many, I guess that what I'm trying to say is there are many different ways to go about it. Um, and, and, and so, you know, you also can't get locked into one way or another, like, uh, you know, there's, this is such a challenging industry that I think you have to just try any, any approach you can to get something made. Miranda, thank you so much for sharing your time and your insights. And thank you to everyone else for tuning in. Thank you so much for having me, Kristen.